What's going on, everybody? Here we are on a Wednesday, halfway through another week. We can make it all the way to the finish line, I think. Now, we've got five really fun questions again this week for uh, that you all have posed to me. Remember, if you ever have a question that you want to hear my take on, don't hesitate. Just simply down below in the comments, leave your question. And I always look forward to hearing what you guys want me to talk about and what you are interested in my opinion on. So that is always a fun part of my week. Uh, usually on Monday or Tuesday, I go through the previous week's video and look through the questions that you all pose to me. So again, do not hesitate if you're interested in hearing my take on anything. Now, this week, I got a couple of questions that asked me to kind of talk about parts of my collection. So I take that opportunity to show you some cards. So coming up here in a few minutes, as I'm answering a couple of the questions, I'm going to show you off some of my stuff. Um, but it's all topical, so it's the stuff that I'm asked about. But that said, let's go ahead and take a look at our very first question for this week. Question for you, Greg. You're at a card show and you see a card that you would like to make an offer on. You check eBay comps as your basis for the offer. You mention to the dealer that recent eBay sales of this card in this condition are going for X. Is this rude? If so, how exactly? Okay, so this is an interesting one. It, it makes me think that maybe you had this experience. Maybe you had the experience of kind of comping a card and then bringing it up to a dealer, and maybe it didn't go so well if you're thinking that maybe some people might think it's rude. Now, I, I, th I think I have a few thoughts on this. Well, I, I, definitely, I definitely have a few thoughts on this. The first thought I have is, I've realized in my life at this point that no matter what the topic is, no matter what the discussion is about or um, there's always going to be a few people out there that are offended by something that I might say or something that I might do, even if I don't have any ill intentions. You know, we, we live in a world where we all have different personalities, we all have different backgrounds, we all have different baggage that have brought us to the place that we currently are at. And even if you're at a card show, who knows what's going on with that person? So I might have a hundred dealers lined up and I might bring up a comp to a hundred dealers and 97 of them wouldn't have any problem with me doing that. And I might have three that just are appalled. I think my guess is, um, and, and my thought process is, you know, as a teacher, which I've been for well over 20 years, I've had to deliver some news and opinions and comments that were probably not well received and probably were things people didn't want to hear. And I've also shared things that, you know, people were probably excited to hear. At the end of the day, I think that ultimately what we have to do is whenever we're communicating with people, we have to put ourselves in their position for a second, okay? We have to consider where, in this case, the dealer is coming from. And, and that's, the first, that, that's the first important point when bringing up something like a comp on a card that you're interested in buying. Now, when you say something to this dealer, if the, if the dealer, it, it depending, and, and, and then here's the other piece. I'll just get right at that. How you say something, how you say something and the way that information is shared or delivered or asked is going to affect how it's received. So we have to keep in mind, number one, the, the feelings and the situation in which the dealer is in. And then number two, we have to be sure that the way that we ask something or the way that we deliver it is done in a way that it's not going to be or could have a lower chance of possibly being received in a negative way. So when a dealer prices a card, right? 
and the dealer is looking to sell the card. They obviously want to sell the card. Well, at least most of them want to sell the card, which is why they paid money to go to the show. They took the time to go to the show. They took the time to set up. They woke up early. They went down. They put their stuff out there. So if we approach a dealer who has a card that's overpriced and we say something along the lines of, I mean, I don't understand. Why do you have that card for $200? All the recent comps are 150. The way that that would possibly be received, I mean, the person probably wants to sell it, which is why it's for sale. And they're paying money to have the opportunity to sell it to you. If you say something like that to somebody, they might be offended that, or embarrassed at the price that they have on it. For all we know, that, that card was stickered six months ago at the last card show that they set up at. So if you kind of go at them with a, well, that's a dumb idea to, to be asking $200 for this card, that probably isn't gonna be well received. So I think that a lot of times it's more about how we ask a question or how we proceed, keeping their, the, you know, their feelings you know, in mind. So if we say, hey, I was looking at this card you have here, I'm super interested. It's a really nice looking card. Um, I see that you have $200 on it and you know, I, I'm very interested, but I've noticed that recently uh, they've been selling for more around 150. Um, is there is there any room in your price on that, or do you have it at 200 for a different reason? Like, kind of where where do you stand on some flexibility in your price? Now, if you if you come at them in a an aggressive way, like that would embarrass them or make them think that that is a dumb price, then yeah, they're probably not going to be that interested in working with you. But if you come at them in more of a humble way, I'll give you another example. There are times that people have cards for sale online on eBay or on other sites, you know, and they'll have a price on it that I think is high. So, a lot of the times, even if it's not a buy it now, I will reach out to them. I will send them a message and I'll say, hey there, um, I'm really interested in this card. Um, was interested to find out if you have you know, much room on your price because I'm, I'm definitely interested in it, but I wasn't sure how firm you are. Now, sometimes people will come back to that email. And again, in an email, it's hard to have tone. And what they'll do is they'll respond with, if I wanted offers, I would have put a best offer on there. I don't have offer. I don't want offers. The price is the price. Take it or leave it. And, and then I move about my day. And other people will say, oh, thanks for reaching out. Now, one of the things I always include when I do that is, I really appreciate your time and consideration. Just a little piece there at the very end when I'm reaching out to them is saying, hey, I don't wanna bother you. You know, I, I know you're probably busy, you have stuff going on and you may not wanna be responding to this, but I really do appreciate your time to respond and considering maybe working with me on the price. It, it, it's not, it doesn't take a lot to get somebody to just kind of feel that your approach is not aggressive and it's more humble. So I don't think personally, so that, that's, <laughs> I just spent several minutes explaining the background and now I guess I'll answer the question. I don't think it's rude to look at comps. You know, uh, when you buy a house, you look at comps. When you buy used cars, you look at like the Kelly Blue Book value or the Edmonds value or whatever. You know, you, you look, looking at comps of things is very normal. And if somebody responds to you in an unfavorable way, it doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. It just means that maybe something's going on with them. But my advice is, sure, if you think something is overpriced in a very humble and considerate way, ask them how flexible they are in the price, while maybe also mentioning that you've noticed the approximate price range that they tend to sell. And 
And at least that gives them the opportunity to not be offended and maybe potentially work with you. You know, some dealers will come back and say, well, you know, I'm asking 200, do you have an offer? Or maybe they'll say, yeah, but this is a really nice copy. And so, you know, sure the grade says this, but I'm asking this because I think that it's undergraded. Which brings up a whole nother can of worms and, and where, place I could go with this, which is when we comp cards, generally speaking, we're comping the grade. We're not, we're, you can't comp the exact card because every card is different. But when you say, when you go to somebody and you say, hey, I noticed that you're asking, you know, 200 for this card, do you have any room in it? Um, I'm, I'm very interested, but it seems like maybe they've been selling for a little bit less. When you say that, right, what you're saying is cards in that grade have been selling for a little bit less. So sometimes people might get a little bit sideways because they're, they're then hearing you talk to them about the grade on the slab instead of the card itself. And that could potentially irritate some people. Not that it should, but it could. Because, you know, for me, I have absolutely paid above comp grade-wise, and I have absolutely paid below comp grade-wise because the card, though it was that grade, there is no, you know, black and white between prices and between conditions and between grades, even though the opinion of the grader who put the grade on the card might like you to believe that it is black and white. There, it, is, it is not a this or a that. There is a gray area between every single grade and every single condition on every single card, regardless of the number on it. So my advice is no, I don't think that you need to uh, avoid using comps, but be considerate of the position that the person is in and with your approach, don't approach them with, why is it this when I see this other price? Because we don't know what's going on. So humbly, kindly, gently go and approach the person and, 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 and maybe have that information in your back pocket if they say, well, why, what were you thinking? And you say, well, I've just noticed that they've been selling for about 150. So I was wondering if, you know, you could get closer to that price. You know, maybe not lead with the comp. Just my two thoughts, <laughs> my two cents, and multiple thoughts on that particular one. What is your opinion on the value of an autograph today in the hobby? It seems to me that the rookie year autograph is still the cream of the crop, but it also appears many Hall of Famers and vet autos have gone up a lot in the past year since COVID. Autos that were $40 are now $100. How important are autos in your collection? Do you prefer a manufacturer pack pulled or in person on card aftermarket? Appreciate your time. Okay, so this is this is a fun question. You know, autographs are certainly part of the hobby. Now, the first place I'll go with my response here is this is why I think even vintage collectors need to be aware of what's happening with modern collecting because I think there's no doubt about it that part of the reason that there has been an increase in interest in vintage autographs is because of the increase in interest in modern cards being autographed. It has become much, much, much more mainstream to have an autographed card in your collection than it used to be. It used to be cards are cards, autographs are autographs. There wasn't a lot of overlap, but that has changed and I think largely that has changed because the stigma, that there used to be a stigma about having cards be autographed, that's now kind of gone largely because of modern cards. So I think the modern card market has affected the vintage card market in that way. It's something that I brought up as a big takeaway after last year's National is watching all this content out there. I saw all these people going after vintage autographed cards. And, and I think that that is a large part of the reason why is the modern card market. Now, for me, do I have autographs? Yes, I have um, uh, most of the autographs I have 
are on balls. And I've done some videos in the past on some of my autograph collection. You know, um, I've talked about some of my experiences. I have some on photos. I have most on baseballs. Um, but I do have some cards that are autographed. And for me, there's really kind of three categories of autographed cards. Again, this is just Greg. I know everybody has their own preferences. Now, one way is a card that was autographed by the person after market, and I was there and watched them do it, okay? I have some of those, and I'm gonna show you some of my autographs here in just a second. The second category are cards that are autographed, and I didn't witness them signing it, but it was signed after market. Card was produced, cards went into packs, card then is obtained by me or someone else and they get that card autographed, okay? So we got aftermarket autograph that I've seen, after aftermarket autograph that I've not seen. I have some of each, okay? And again, we're gonna take a look at both here in a second. And then the third category for me are pack pulled autographs. Now, I think when pack pulled autographs started, I don't think there were a ton of shenanigans going on. And I also think kind of the era of the player involved uh, affects whether there may be worse some shenanigans going on. But, um, you know, when you look at some of the early pack pulled autographs, I think I'm, I'm, I'm personally very, very confident in their authenticity. Then I think we went through a stretch more recently where we were sending out lots, or not we, manufacturers were sending out lots of cards and lots of stickers all over the place through the mail to different athletes, and then they were showing up signed. And it is not that hard, and you don't have to look that far to find where some of those autographs don't look like the other autographs. And that is uh, not a coincidence, I don't think. Now, I do know that a lot of the manufacturers, um, Tops in particular, has been doing a lot more of having an actual uh, employee present as cards were signed, being signed specifically more in the last year or two. Now, that I think is a good move in the right direction. Um, I like kind of the manufacturer pack, pu pack pulled autograph thing. I do like those. I have some of all of these. Now, what do I think about the future of it? Um, I think autographs are here to stay with cards. I think that they um, add a rarity or uh, add a dimension to the card that people like. So I don't think it's going away. Um, let me talk more about this as I show you some of my autographs, some of which fall into each of those three categories. So let's take a look at those. All right, so first off, I've got an autograph I got in person. This is Willie McCovey. I got on a card. Oh, I was probably 11 or so, 12 maybe, when I got this signed by McCovey at a card show. It was free. Uh, how about my Arnold Palmer autograph? Got that in person. They used to have a senior tour event in Napa, California, and got that signed by Arnie after he left the 18th green. And then I got my boy, Jose. I got the Conseco rated rookie. Got that at a card show last year. And, you know, those are my autographs that are in person. Now, pack pulled type stuff. Got my Tino Martinez, Tier 1. I really like these Tier 1 cards, but... I don't know. I just, I mean, Bernie Williams, though I wasn't there, I, I just, I just believe that that's Bernie's actual autograph. Um, Ozzie Smith, same thing. You know, I've seen some of these autographs enough that you just kind of know them, but then, you know, it's top certified or whatever. Here's a Bill Walton. Um, you know, I collect a lot of basketball, uh, a lot of football, and, oh, here's our Cepeda. I got this at a card show the other day. Pack pulled card. Topps Chrome autographed five bucks of a Hall of Famer. That's insane. Maybe you remember that from a video if you've been watching. Here's a nice Jerry West National Treasures card. This one's actually for sale online, as is this one. Uh, my Dr. J. Julius Irvin. I got this because that autograph is beautiful with that gold ink. That one's also... I got for sale on my eBay account right now. Very cool. And then this Oscar Robertson. 
Got a 10-9. Really cool autograph of him as well. So those are pack-pulled type autographs. Um, and then I have some through-the-mail stuff. So here's an Eric Dickerson rookie card. He signs through the mail. I think he charges about 20 bucks, something like that. Uh, Ryan Sandberg rookie card, autographed through the mail. He's been a big through-the-mail signer for a few years. Um, then I got a Dennis Eckersley on his rookie card. I mean, we're talking about Hall of Famers on rookie cards. They just buy the card, send it off, and... You know, most of them charge a little bit. I think Eckersley charged like 10 bucks or something. I think Boggs is about the same on his rookie card there. So, again, these ones are all TTM. Tom Watson signs through the mail. This is his quote-unquote rookie card. Most people say that's not his rookie card. Yeah, he has cards before it, but it's his first mainstream set. How about Hall of Famer Mike Mussina on his score rookie card, his draft pick card? Um, he signs through the mail. I think he's about $10, as is a Juan Marichal. I don't know, maybe 15 something like this. I can't remember. But these are all through the mail autographs. I think Goose Gossage is free, if I'm not mistaken. But So through the mail as well, lots of options. My question is that I would like to get your thoughts, if you have any, on the non-sports vintage cards and their place in the hobby going forward. We see that you are collecting pirate cards and have heard you mention the look and see cards in the past and was wondering if there are any other vintage non-sport cards in your collection. Do you see the hobby expanding in the future to include more collectors that gravitate to these types of cards and or sets like Star Wars, Batman, Superman, classic TV shows, music, or the U.S. presidents and other historical leaders? It seems that this could be a growth segment of collectors in the future if more history buffs and pop culture collectors got into card collecting. I am personally working on a set of the 1952 Look and See cards and really love them and all the diversity of characters in the set. What are your thoughts? Thanks. So you are talking to a guy who loves non-sport cards. I love them. I have always liked them, um, and I like them as much right now as I ever have. And, um, you know, I talk on my channel about mostly my baseball card collecting. I talk, I've talked a fair amount about basketball cards. I've talked a fair amount about football cards. In fact, we have another question coming here in a minute that is going to go a little bit further into each of those. But I love cards as a medium, as a collectible. You know, some people are into figurines and statues. That's not really my thing, but that's some people's thing. Some people like, you know, more art that you hang on the wall. You know, some people that like art are more into sculptures. Now, I am more personally into card collecting. I like cards a lot. And I'm gonna show you some of my cards, some of my non-sport cards here in just a second as well. I think, that there are, and just like I mentioned a minute ago, there are things that happen with current modern collecting that affect vintage collecting. Now, when we hear uh, companies talking about things like Fanatic saying, we're gonna 10X the hobby. In order to 10X the hobby, if they're gonna 10X the hobby, they're going to need to broaden their collector base. In order to broaden their collector base, there's a few ways they could do that, right? They could, Broaden their collector base by going international, right? That's certainly possible, and to a certain extent, some of that is happening, right? PSA, setting up facilities in other countries even, you know, manufacturing happening, and shipping is much easier, communication is much easier internationally, so that's certainly one place. But a place that I really think, if they're really going to 10X the hobby, then I think a lot of that 10X is going to come from other areas like TCG, right? Like trading card games, like the Pokemon thing, like Disney has gotten involved, like these other companies, Marvel cards have become very popular. So right now what we've kind of done is we've kind of uh, done mostly sports figures and we've also done uh, fictional figures, right? But I also think that there is certainly a group of people, for example, 
people that are really into music. If you're really, really into music and you're really into, you know, Metallica and Nirvana, for example, and, and it became more mainstream to collect cards, you know, not just baseball sports cards, but cards in general of different things, then I could see that vintage market picking up in those areas as well. Absolutely, I think that's very possible. So when you look along modern cards, one of the questions I would have if I had someone high up in Fanatics sitting here talking to me is, you're talking about 10X the hobby, what are the groups specifically that you think you can and will target? And, and I think that that's one of the places. I think pop culture is a place that hadn't been hit much, but is starting to. You look at Leaf, Leaf has these pop culture cards. You can get cards of different, you know, actors and actresses, performing artists, bands, different, you know, musicians and things. And, and if that industry within cards were to continue to grow, I think it would affect the vintage ones as well, right? I, I think that people, by nature, tend to get into cards in current. You tend to go who are the current people. And then when you kind of get a little bit bored with that, you tend to go back to his historical stuff. Most of the vintage collectors are not just collecting old stuff because they were that age. Though there are a lot of collectors like that. There's a lot of us that go, I was into you know cards in the 80s and those are everywhere. But this other thing, this, these Mickey Mantle cards, these Hank Aaron cards, these Willie Mays cards, those are kind of harder to come by than, you know, an 87 tops Mark McGuire, which I love, by the way. But so I could see that happening and that expansion happening. Now, I'm not going to pretend like for a single second that I'm an expert at non-sport cards. I'm certainly not. If you want an expert at non-sport cards, you want to go directly to Breakout Cards and you want to go to Ryan Nolan's channel. He is phenomenal. He has an insane amount of expertise at non-sport cards. And I think that there's a lot to non-sport cards. I have some vintage non-sport cards and I have some more uh, childhood nostalgia non-sport cards. And so I want to show you some some of my non-sport cards. And uh, some of them are nostalgia-ish from, you know, the 70s and 80s. And some of them are older, which I've talked about before. But, but let's take a look at some of my non-sport collection. All right, so you asked about vintage non-sport. So I said, hey, this is an opportunity to show off some of my pirate cards. My N19 Allen and Ginter from 1888. I just love these cards. I've been slowly chipping away at the set. There are 50 cards in the set. I have about 20 of them at this point. So got that one not all that long ago. I just kind of fell into these, these cards randomly, and now I love them. The color in person is incredible. And here is another. So I'm going to show you some stuff besides just my pirate cards, but I figured... I got to at least use the opportunity to share these, even in a one. I mean, you look at this card, the color on it is incredible. There is some paper loss on the back, which is the reason that this one got a one. But you guys know I love these cards. I talk about them all the time. It doesn't matter what it is you collect. If it's something you like, then you should go for it. And you look at this one at 3.5. And that's a beautiful 3.5, a little off center on the back, I guess. Otherwise, probably would get a better grade. Again, the color on these, the image is incredible on these Allen and Ginter cards. So those are some of my pirate collection. Now, I showed you this the other day. This is one of my February pickups. My Kermit, my Kermit card is a new edition, which I love. I got my Darth Vader rookie card, 1977 original Star Wars set. I got this as a... a been graded a six by PSA, assigned a six. And how could you not want a Darth Vader? Now, these I know aren't vintage, but they're still cool pop culture, just to show you kind of an array of what I've got. Here's in 1980. You're looking at a Yoda rookie card. Yes, this is the first time Yoda appeared on a card. 
and it is from the Empire Strikes Back series from the Star Wars card sets. And then this is a very cool card. This is also Empire Strikes Back. This is 1980, and uh, this one's got a high grade. This one got an 8. The rookie card is a 6. You can see the back there and the colors. But again, I, I really, really enjoy um, non sport stuff a lot. And I'm going to keep showing you more of it because I got a fair amount of... Now, some people would say, well, this is a sport. And some people would say, no, it's not. But I had to take the opportunity to show you my Hulk Hogan rookie card. It's not technically his rookie card, but it is his first tops card. And then I got my Atom Bomb. This is my Grail Garbage Pail Kid card. I picked this up about a year ago in a PSA 7 holder. Got the cheater's license back, not the checklist variation. But side to side centering is awesome. Love the card. That is nostalgia at its finest. And then I got some more stuff. I got the look and sees that was mentioned in the question. I love the look and see set. I have this Paul Revere. Um, these are from 1952. And the same artist that did the 52 Tops baseball was commissioned for the 52 Tops look and see. And I had a really nice person, <laughs> a really nice uh, viewer of the channel sent me a couple the other day. So I had to take the opportunity to show them since it came up that Albert Einstein is a big card in the set, as is the Queen Elizabeth, which is a beautiful card. Both of these, I was I was over the moon blessed that these were sent to me. Um, and then I have, you know, some other stuff in my collection besides just graded. I do collect a lot of raw. So here's some more look and see. So you got my Henry Ford look and see. Really a sharp card. It's a little off center. But for a card from 52, it's pretty sweet. You got my Harry Truman here is gorgeous. I've thought about grading these, but then I'm like, why? I don't, I'm not selling them. I'm just, I love them. How about my Thomas Edison? That's another beauty. I have a really nice Ben Franklin. Pretty much perfectly centered all the way around. Corners have a little touch on them, but not much. Got a nice George Washington, one of the bigger cards in the set. Again, these are 52 tops made these look and sees. I got my Thomas Jefferson. A little OC, but nice. And how about my Alexander Hamilton? Another beauty. So I've just slowly picked these up over time. And then my Wright Brothers. I got the Inventors in there as well. It's a great set with a wide variety. There is a Babe Ruth in it. And then I got some childhood cards. I got the Star Wars. Had to have a few A-Team cards of my guy, Mr. T. He was the coolest. And then I got some Clark Kent and some Superman stuff. There was a series, a sticker series in there as well, similar to Star Wars. Got the Fonz. Got the Fonz sticker. Love that. And I got the Clark Kent. And then not to be left out, Miss Lois Lane. So I got a lot of non-sport stuff. My question to you. I collect most sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and boxing. Of the top 20 Hall of Fame or name recognition players in each, that list consists of pre-war, vintage, and modern. What is your thoughts on a collection like that? I see so many focus on one sport or maybe two. My collection has Ruth, Mantle, Mays, Clemente, Robinson, Mookie, Trout, Namath, Unitas, Star. Brady, Montana, Howe, Orr, Gretzky, Ovechkin, Crosby, McDavid, Louis, Ollie, Tyson. Many focus on one sport. I like all the sports. So I purposely put this question back to back with the non-sport question because I think there's a lot of overlap between those two questions. One thing that I think is overlap is if you are a card collector in general, I think it is very easy to transition over to things besides just baseball cards or football cards or basketball cards. Now, again, you're talking to a person who collects all of it. You know, I have a, a, a full top scale Sayers run. You know, I've got uh, several Jim Brown cards. I have several Johnny Unitas cards. I have several Bart Starr cards, you know, just in vintage football. I have 
uh, you know, more, uh, more of my childhood guys, like I have, you know, Montana's and I have Warren Moon's and I have Jerry Rice's and I collect all of that. And I also collect basketball. You know, the main players I collect in basketball, at least in vintage basketball, are Wilt Chamberlain, Oscar Robertson, and, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Alcindor, uh, some of his cards are still Lou Alcindor that I own. So I, I certainly am a, a collector of multiple sports. Some of you have seen at a recent card show, I picked up some hockey cards. I have a few Wayne Gretzky cards. I have a few other players as well. So, I mean, you're, you're talking to a guy who likes a variety of cards. Do I think it's good to like a variety of sports cards? Of course, I, I love it. I love them. So because I love them, then I'm all for it. But I also think there is certainly something to be said for having such a wide approach. There being so many different things that you like and collect that it's too much. And I personally am constantly trying to narrow the things that I collect. Even in just baseball cards, if you say I collect baseball cards, everything from 1900 to current, there's so much to that, it's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. And a video that I'm, I, I, have, in, I have in my mind, the, the hamster is spinning on slightly and, and is starting to kind of turn and, and it's, it's, grinding, <laughs> it's grinding in those gears up above and I'm stewing on and I'm kind of mentally planning is on how to narrow your collecting not widen um, just because there's so much out there. I was having a, a conversation with my friend David the other day and he was like, sometimes, and I don't want to go too far into this because again, I'm, I'm planning on doing a whole video on this, but you know, it, it's not necessarily about what do you collect. It's about start eliminating things. I don't collect that. I don't collect this. I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll just use an example. Somebody who might say, I'm not gonna collect hockey. I'm not gonna collect basketball. I'm only gonna collect football and baseball. Or I'm not gonna collect pre-war. I'm not gonna collect modern. I'm only gonna collect things between these years. To a certain extent, if you can just start eliminating certain categories, it allows you to be focused. And, and I like a broad collection. I have a broad collection but it also feels like I'm going in 80 directions at once. I'm like the octopus that's being pulled, you know, in all these different directions at the same time that I can't, I don't even know where to go. And so that's one of my struggles and I've talked about that struggle is I like so much, I think I like too much. So as much as I like a variety of sports, at least it sounds like you've narrowed it to about 20 people, 20 athletes, 20 goats really. I get that, that at least gives you focus. So I'm all about a diverse collection. I think I have a very diverse collection and I, I totally understand the appeal. But I think the key is if you expand, are you getting too broad and not focused enough? That's my only concern about collecting a wide variety of sports. So staying focused on certain athletes like you are makes a lot of sense. Craig, I know that most YouTubers are PSA and SGC fans. Even though BGS has lost market share, do you think the BGS 9.5 will always be in demand from collectors and hold its value? So the first thing that struck me on this question was how it said, I know you and other YouTubers are like really just into PSA and SGC. And that, I, that one, that struck me. And one of the reasons it struck me is because I've never really thought of myself as, oh, well, I'm on the PSA and SGC bandwagon. Um, I, I think, I, uh, how, do I, how do I go about this? So for me, and I did a video, you know, my buddy Theo on Clemente Collector, he did a video the other day and he was comparing the, the value, possible value of what, you know, uh, a CGC card sells for compared to PSA and what a, you know, Beckett card sells for compared to, you know, SGC and PSA. And if it was a buying opportunity because there was 
um, a premium for PSA and then a premium for SGC and whether it made, meant that these other companies were a good deal. Um, I do think that there's something to looking into that. Because again, you know, if we're buying the card, not the grade, buying the card, not the holder, here's, here's the thing. I, I don't think it's that YouTubers are all about PSA and SGC as much as I think it is the universal acceptance of PSA and SGC versus the others. I don't, I don't have negative things to say about the other companies. I, I've said I only buy PSA and SGC. That doesn't mean, although I do have some BGS. I don't have any BVG cards, but, uh, but I do have BGS. And, and it's not that I have negative things to say about them. It's just they're, they're less liquid and they're less, um, they would be much more difficult to sell because the community as a whole tends to not be interested in those. Now, should they not be interested in those? That's a completely different story. But, you know, if, if, uh, if I were to go buy a used car for my daughter, okay, and I go out, <laughs> and now if you drive this car, don't be offended, but if I go out and I buy a Saturn, okay, remember the company Saturn? And the cool thing about Saturn that was great is that Saturn, it was the sticker price was the price. There was no negotiation. You didn't have to worry about the haggle thing. So some people liked that. Well, I don't think I would buy Lucy a Saturn car, be, not because there's anything wrong with Saturn, but because if we decided to sell the Saturn, there aren't a lot of people that are out looking for Saturns. People are out looking for Camrys, Accords, things like that. So if I buy her a Saturn and we decide, or she decides or whatever, to move that car along, it's gonna be harder to sell the Saturn than it is to sell the Camry, right? So because Camrys are universally accepted as fairly reliable used cars, they're very, very easy to sell. That's how I would compare it. I would say that PSA is the easiest to sell. It's a Camry, okay? And I would say that, you know, an SGC, it might be like a, a, a Nissan Sentra or something right? And, and I might say that, uh, that a, a BVG is like a, you know, I don't know, a Chevy Malibu. And I might say that CGC is a Saturn. So one of the reasons that I think people put things in PSA holders is because PSA has been universally accepted as things stand right now at this very moment that it's the most liquid because the most people are open to owning a PSA graded card. And less people are interested in a CGC card. And there's a variety of reasons that that might be the case, but that's kind of, because, because the community is most interested in PSA and then SGC, that tends to be what I kind of focus my attention on because that's what the community tends to kind of think. Now I've just spent five minutes talking about, you know, this topic and I haven't even answered your question, but that's, <laughs> I think I do that a lot. I do that a lot, don't I? I talk a lot about a topic without actually answering the question. I'm setting the stage for my opinion. Do I think BVG, uh, do I think BGS will hold its value? None of us know. None of us know if SGC will hold its value or, or PSA will hold its value. It, it all is dependent on what happens moving forward. If, if Beckett goes under, if Beckett goes away, do I think a BVG or a BGS slab would lose some value? Yeah, I think it probably would. If, if uh, Beckett got bought out, and somebody injected some money and they improved some things that got improved some marketing and improved some speed, turnaround times, things like that. Do I think that those cards could shoot back up like they used to be as a premium brand? Absolutely. So I don't think we can speculate on a thing like uh, what's gonna happen to the health of a company or a brand. We don't know. I mean, there was a time 
that you know you would see certain brands that were at like the premium stores and now you can buy that stuff at target and walmart right and and that doesn't mean that it's bad it just means that it's changed the where that particular brand is positioned has changed so i have no idea i will say this about bgs specifically bgs tends to be a fairly universally accepted brand with modern cards and younger collectors. In some ways, it feels like, if, we're, if I'm talking about like a, a rookie patch auto, right? I think that some younger collectors would rather it be in a BGS slab than an, even an SGC slab. So I think that there's a very real possibility that having that a seed rooted with the younger collectors is going to buy them more time than another company who might otherwise be in the position that Beckett is currently in. Like, there's a lot of people who the BGS 9.5 is a very accepted thing. And if there's anything that is true, it's that people tend to be resistant to change. They tend to be resistant to change and trying a new product or a new company when they're already using a company that they're okay with. So to answer your question, I don't really have an opinion other than to say, um, I think that the health of the BGS label is strongest with newer uh, modern cards and younger collectors who are into modern, uh, especially autographed and, and patched cards. That's kind of my experience, but again, this is not an, an area that falls uh, right into my wheelhouse, but that's the best answer I think I can give you. And if you guys have a question for next week's episode, I hope that you won't hesitate for a second. Down below in the comments, you don't have to say, hey, Greg, this is my question. Just ask your question in the comments below, and I'm excited to read them next week and share my thoughts.